Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the fourth in our series of five uh, weekly webinars to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Hyperledger. Hyperledger was announced on December 17th, 2015, as a new initiative form to pull together the really exciting work being done in the blockchain uh, and, and cryptocurrency space and try to understand how to make that usable and appropriate for enterprises and for, for broader business purposes. Uh, and um, we've accomplished a lot in those five years and really pulled together um, an amazing set of software, but also really it's more about the community uh, because you can have great open source code, but if you don't have a community around it, adding to it, bu building upon it, uh, pushing it forward faster, uh, uh, it's kind of, it's not, doesn't mean much, right? Um, and so in celebration of that community and in celebration of the different use cases out there, we've put together this series of panels to help people understand where and how the, these technologies are being used, um, both hyperledger technologies and those that are, that are even beyond uh, just the core that we have here because this is a broad movement. And this is something that uh, over the five years has grown uh, to be to be rather substantial and particularly now uh, 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 affecting the very traditional and old world uh, 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 world of the banking systems. Um, uh, we've seen years and years now of investment into this space uh, of everybody from upstarts, uh, fintech uh, and the like to, to uh, the central banks of the world really taking a look at this. And so we really wanted to pull together a set of voices um, from our community and some who are on the periphery of our community uh, to, to take a look at, at where those things or where those technologies are heading and how they will affect the world of finance. Um, and to uh, first, uh, again, I want to repeat and encourage folks, if you're new, uh, if you just landed, do use the, the the chat functionality to tell us in one line kind of the city, state, or country um, uh, you're from, just so we get a, a feel, a better feel for who you are. Um, I will also mention on the Hyperledger website, uh, the five-year anniversary spot, there is a place to claim a free t-shirt. You do have to pay for shipping. Um, we couldn't sign up to, to ship all around the world, uh, but but uh, if you can cover that, you get a free t-shirt to help us celebrate the fifth anniversary. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for the panel, Laura Shin. Laura is a crypto and blockchain journalist. Uh, she's covered uh, this space for a lot of different major publications. Uh, she's also the host of the Unchained uh, podcast that is a tremendous amount of readership and has been going for quite, a, quite some time now. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn the mic over to Laura. Laura, take it away. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel. Um, so we have three great speakers for you. Uh, one is Bob Bench, who's the Assistant Vice President at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. We also have Rob Palatnik, Managing Director of Global Head of Technology Research and Innovation at the D DTCC, and who is also Chairman of the Hyperledger Board. And then Mathieu St. Olive, CodeFi Payments Product Manager and CBDC Advisor at Consensus. Welcome to our panelists. Why don't we start by having you each go around and stating what it is that you and your organization do and how it is that you're either working on central bank digital currencies or other blockchain related initiatives. Um, how about we start with Bob? I think the Robert Bench is known as Bob. I'm still Robert. <laughs> Bob. Oh, okay. Let's not start with Bob because I don't know if he can hear us or his camera's frozen or something. Rob, why don't you start? I'm um, sure. Um, thank you very much, Laura, and thanks thanks to the panelists. Uh, and first, as as chairman of of the Hyperledger uh, Board of Governors, I would like to congratulate Hyperledger on on five years. Uh, I think the accomplishments just in helping uh, push software, push the ideas, push the concepts and push the discussion and bring together the community in sessions like this uh, has been um, phenomenal and, and part of you know, the, the great value that Hyperledger is bringing to, to the world as we embark on this journey. Uh, so I'm, I run um, research and innovation for DTCC. DTCC is Depository Trusting Clearing Corporation. Uh, we're a, one of the premier uh, financial industry post-trade infrastructures in the world, uh, in the United States, where the primary uh, mechanism for clearing and settlement of uh, equities, cash trades, uh, most of the non-futures and non-option markets all settle through DTCC. Um, so we're not a payment organization. We're primarily 
uh, a clearing and settlement uh, and regulatory reporting and data organization, uh, but we move assets around and having a new and consistent set of payment rails uh, would certainly benefit our client, our, our industry. Great. Now over and to Bob. Yeah, thanks for picking up the slack, Rob. <laughs> um, and thank you for having me, Laura and Brian. Uh, so uh, my name is Bob Bench, I'm an AVP at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, Mm, so our, okay. what our team does is we DCI. With a, I'm going to kill my video, Laura, so it goes a little better. Okay. Is this better? Well, hopefully. Let's try it. Keep going. Yeah, the audio all, is the most important. Right. So. Yep. Um, so in association with the DCI at MIT, uh, we are working on a general purpose central bank digital currency research project. Uh, the main idea here, as opposed to Rob's organization, which handles the securities markets, uh, we are trying to understand what are the trade-offs and trying to build a fiat alternative, uh, fiat alternative digital currency. Um, and we're starting at the core layer. Uh, we think that there are unique design requirements to central banks' fiat currencies. And uh, we think that that needs to be built and, and we're going to try to build it um, for research purposes. Um, what we think about it is almost a Linux for central bank currencies. Uh, and so we are uh, in year one of this project. We plan on releasing open source software in summer 2021, along with a white paper. Uh, and we look forward to people from the community testing our product, playing with our product, much like uh, Hyperledger and Linux did uh, over their history. Uh, and we're, we're excited to uh, release this and get your feedback. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll have some questions about that. Um, but before that, why don't we turn to Matthew? Hi, uh, so Mathieu saint olive I'm leading Consensus work uh, on CBDC globally. So briefly, Consensus is a software company, a pioneer in blockchain. Uh, our founder and CEO, Joseph Rubin, co-created uh, Ethereum six years ago and then created Consensus to build a community around Ethereum. And we are really in between public blockchain, uh, innovation and enterprise and strongly believe in, in this, the convergence of the two and CBDC is a great example of this. Uh, we are really close to Hyperledger and really grateful to be part of this uh, community. We have contributed to Hyperledger with uh, Hyperledger Bezu, which is uh, an Ethereum client, uh, open source Ethereum client, which we submitted uh, almost two years ago. And we strongly believe that uh, Hyperledger brings a lot of value uh, by having this, uh, by being this greenhouse with 15 projects, uh, which allows for collaboration, creation of standards, and, and all of this is really critical for, for enterprise adoption. And then more specifically uh, on CBDC, so we are really committed to support central banks on CBDC. Uh, we are working with six different central banks on CBDC pilots, uh, wholesale, retail, and cross-border uh, pilots. Um, and, and yeah, right now we believe that uh, central banks do not yet plan to go live uh, with CBDC. They need, they are cautious by nature. And so they need experimentation. They need to understand, uh, as you said, Bob, what are the trade-offs, what are the capabilities, and how to implement it uh, very concretely. And so it's uh, really exciting times for us to, to see this technology being used uh, uh, by such high-profile in institutions. So as I'm sure everyone's well aware, when it comes to blockchain technology, people always make a joke that um, the solution to everything is just to put a blockchain or put it on a blockchain. But um, obviously that's, that's just a joke because that's not the case. So when it comes to central bank digital currencies, what are the main problems that could be solved or alleviated with central, um, uh, sorry, the problems with central bank money that could be alleviated or resolved with blockchain technology? And, and, and this is just an open question. Anyone can answer it. So I think that if I can start uh, uh, briefly, uh, I think there are three main problems uh, in terms of which are wholesale, retail, and, and cross-border. So wholesale, uh, there are already existing RTGS systems uh, and uh, intervention settlement, which work pretty well but uh, there are delays and costs associated to this. And uh, more importantly, there is lack of programmability and programmability do not solve the problem, but provide additional value. 
For cross-border payments, obviously, we are still relying on our correspondent banking infrastructure that is uh, completely outdated, very slow, very costly. And here, many people believe uh, that CBDC can, can significantly facilitate cross-border payments. And then for retail CBDC, uh, I'm not sure we solve the problem because in developed countries, we have great means of payments, uh, but it can be more relevant for developing countries. And even for developed countries, it will actually not solve problems, but create new opportunities. And um, Rob, do you, do you want to add something from the wholesale side? Yeah, so, so from, the, from the wholesale perspective, um, and I guess uh, Matteo touched on, on two aspects uh, to uh, the digital currency that if realized in a central bank digital currency uh, would be of tremendous value. One is that they would be digital uh, and they would be a consistent uh, methodology for, for recording those payments uh, and tracking and tracking where where the money is moving, uh, and second that they're program they're programmable. Uh, so those two things in com a combination is what really brings that value within the wholesale uh, ecosystem of the financial industry. Uh, there are many different process flows that are really unique to every asset class. So equities has a particular process flow, various fixed income um, transactions have process flows, money markets have their process flow, and all of these have their own settlement workflow, their own margin models. Uh, so it seems fairly obvious that uh, if we adopt a more efficient payment rail uh, that consolidated uh, all of the, the uh, cash movements for our, our clients in the industry, uh, that it would be much easier for our clients to manage their liquidity needs. Uh, so it just, the math of it just seems much simpler. And Bob, yeah. did you want to add anything? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, we're certainly not wedded to a blockchain architecture, uh, but, you know, certainly there are advantages there. Resiliency across distributed networks, uh, there's benefits there. Um, and again, our research is primarily around trade-offs, right? So the challenge with distributed networks is they're really complex and complexity adds attack surfaces. And those things can cause challenge to one of our most important goals, which is security. Um, but in certainly the traceability of certain blockchains is very intriguing from an AML CFT standpoint. Right, the ability of firms like Chainalysis and Elliptic to track funds globally fairly instantly, um, as long as you have some KYC somewhere along that along that trail, is is really unique and interesting and new for the AML CFT world. Uh, so again, I, I think there's a lot of positive aspects, um, and we're looking at those and, and what trade offs exist what, with those distributed systems. Yeah, I imagine that there's a segment of the leadership that already has their um, uh, <laughs> hackles raised about what you just said. Um, but actually, before we get to that, because obviously that raises privacy issues, I do want to just ask you about something that you mentioned in the beginning about how you're working on the solution and you're going to re release the code for it in the summer. So I'm just curious, you know, if you work are working on solutions for central bank digital currencies, then do you see that as something that uh, would be an open source technology and a government would build that kind of solution using open source code? Of course. And governments currently use a plethora of open source core code. Much of the government architecture is built off Linux. Uh, and, you know, we at least, at least our research team in concert with MIT, we don't believe in security by obscurity. We think that if code is going to be secure, you need a lot of people looking at it and a lot of people working on it. Uh, and it's very hard for that to be done when it's a very small classified team. Um, again, we, you know, the Federal Reserve and Treasury have not made any announcements regarding uh, central bank digital currency plans to go live in any sense of the word. Uh, but we think the best use of our research time is to build something open source where we can build off the minds of the women and men who take part in the open source community. And why are you building something as opposed to maybe using one of the existing technologies? Uh, one is, and to be sure, our, our division uh, will be evaluating public and private platforms uh, to test our, plat our own in-house build. Um, but one, you know, I think it's, uh, it's really interesting to build something from the ground up. You learn a lot about 
uh, your platform if you build it yourself. You learn a lot about the difficulties. You learn a lot about the trade-offs that we may not have learned if we exclusively use a provider. I think that's critically important. Um, two is, you know, I think joining with MIT, we are really building on some of the better brains in this space. Uh, Neha Narula, who runs the DCI, uh, has put together a fantastic team of some of the top cryptographers and developers in the world in this area. And, and we want to see what they can do with the very unique design requirements for central bank digital currency. Um, as far as I understand, there is not a single platform that has exclusively been built for the design requirements for central bank digital currency. Uh, there's been a lot of enterprise chains for value, for, so to speak, but we think central banks have unique design requirements and we're going to try to build for that purpose. And Mathieu, you've worked with a number of different governments or, or consensus is working or has worked with um, South Africa, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, Australia. And I just wondered how do concerns differ across countries and what factors tend to affect their concerns? Is it like the size of the country or are there cultural factors or is it about kind of the existing penetration of fintech technology or, you know, how, how are different governments thinking about this? Yes, if I, just before answering the question, I just want to react uh, on what Bob said about uh, open source, which I think is quite important is that one of the great benefits of DLT, is, uh, open source, is that it, the transfer of value, the value capability is embedded. And so it's much different from any other uh, technologies like database or whatever. Here you have the, the, the protocol itself allows transfer of value. Uh, which uh, and then on top of this open source software, people will build uh, additional proprietary uh, applications and, and make a business out of it. And this we see this as the opportunity also to, to foster digital innovation. And the Bank of England has forecasted a boost of GDP of three uh, percent um, with, with the general purpose CBDC, which I think is quite exciting. Then when it comes to in in our discussion with central banks. There are several things. So, so first of all, this technology is new to them. So first, the, the first thing they need is to basically get their hands dirty and start to understand exactly what, uh, what are the capabilities, what are the trade-offs, uh, and, and how they can implement it. When we look at the, at the technology layers, they have some concerns about how we can manage privacy, how we can manage uh, transaction throughput, so how many transactions per second you can manage. So, and um, and how will it be interoperable with other systems, uh, whether it is legacy uh, systems or new DLT platforms that might be built with the same protocol or with different protocols. So they have the, this, this need of understanding the technology, but what, as, as we see the market uh, becoming more and more mature, central banks are also more focused on what the use case is, what the application. And here collaboration between the public, so the central banks and the private sector is absolutely key because they need to understand not only how the individuals will use the CBDC, but how the enterprises, how the, the, the private sector will, will be able to use it, how it will solve their, their, their pain points and how it will allow them new opportunities. And so there's obviously a lot of um, collaboration, uh, very useful with the financial institution uh, uh, for the wholesale layer, but also uh, for the, the, I mean, any merchants, uh, who, every merchants need a means of payment. And so understanding how they can manage their subscriptions, their invoices in a smarter way, in a better way, uh, is very uh, important for the central bank to understand to properly design it. And Rob, um, why don't you maybe give more insight to what Mathieu just said and tell us how the DTCC currently works with central banks and maybe mention some of the pain points that he discussed as well as new opportunities that you see could um, come with a, a CBDC. Sure. Um, and you know, I, I guess the way you know, we look at the entire um, uh, ecosystem in the financial industry and and in the financial markets uh, across across the globe basically uh, is is that they're they're helping people manage their uh, their retirement accounts uh, their pension funds you know the, the the financial industry serves a purpose that that benefits to benef that benefits everyone uh, so being able to move assets and move value in exchange for those assets uh, with a complete confidence 
in the integrity of the markets and in the integrity of your that your asset is accounted for or your money is accounted for is critical. Uh, and DTCC's primary focus has long been on that resiliency, on the safety and soundness of markets. And that when you make a trade of, an, of a security, you buy a stock, uh, you sell a stock, you sell a money market instrument, that when you do that transaction, you get your money or you, you get your stock. And it is unquestioned uh, that that accounting exists, uh, is reliable, has integrity, is verifiable. Uh, so the markets that exist today have instrumented that and built that uh, through decades of incremental advancement, incremental advancement in the technology, uh, in market, market practices, in regulation, in oversight. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States and central banks around the world have been critical components of making sure that those markets have that safety and soundness, uh, that they can scale when scale and performance is necessary that in, in the um, face of market volatility and disruptions, that they're resilient and, and that everyone always can be confident that those markets work. So when we start looking at, so all of that is kind of table stakes. That's the foundation. You know, when something goes wrong at two in the morning today, everyone knows exactly what happened. That's the point in time where we're processing variable annuities or, or you know, there's something in the process that already is going on there that we've been working on for decades. It's been instrumented. It comes up on your alert screen. Uh, you know exactly how to respond. As we start moving into replacing components of the infrastructure and especially the payment rails, you're going to have to have that same degree of confidence that when something goes wrong, you know exactly how to fix it. You know exactly where to find that problem uh, and that the system itself is resilient in the face of, of um, security attacks, of, of unexpected, you know, um, uh, natural disasters, of, of any kind of, of, of disruption, and that the markets can keep on operating. So our focus in the wholesale markets has long been making sure that train works and that all of it works without problem, without fail, and that we can test failure scenarios, that we can try things out. Payments is a critical part of how DTCC processes. Uh, the equity markets have a cycle. Trading occurs on exchanges. Today's cycle is at the end of the day. Uh, all day long, those trades are submitted uh, into a organization, central securities, clearing corporations and depositories. Uh, then at the end of the day, traditionally, we have various netting cycles. Some activity settles on a two-day basis. And everyone knows that in two days, all of your settlements net down and you have to settle, you either have to send a security or receive a security and then you have to either send a payment or receive a payment and that all nets. So 200 million uh, trades net down to 1 million payments. Uh, so in this world with central bank digital currency, making sure that that payment is as reliable and as durable and has integrity, it's non-refutable, it can't be duplicated, uh, it can't be denied that you actually made that payment uh, and that it has the same uh, integrity as payments do today and better because it's traceable uh, to the degree privacy and regulations want it to be traceable um, and that you can have confidence that once it's executed, it's immutable. Uh, all of those add, would add tremendous value to the existing system. So we're going to get a little bit more into kind of the technical details around how to structure a CBDC on the back end. But I actually want to draw in one of the questions that came in through Q&A from Jacques. And <laughs> hopefully I'm not going to butcher this name too much. Beacon Du, it looks like, um, who wrote, should CBDCs be blockchain based? Why or why not? Um, I don't know if maybe Bob or Matthew want to address this, but um, maybe we should just get that question out of the way before we talk about more technical details. Uh, again, I, I think one thing that we try to reiterate is in our research, we find that while I think there is a great value to interoperability among CBDCs to solve some of the cross-border issues, every country needs to decide for themselves the design requirements, right? Like any good product manager, you're focusing on your customer. And the customers of Sweden may be very different than the customers uh, in the, for the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. And so you need to solve the problems that your customer is bringing to you. Uh, 
And so there might be economies that the blockchain may help out and there might be ones where a centralized database uh, is a lot more appropriate. And I think that's something that needs to be discussed is you, every central bank needs to solve the problems of their customers. Like every, every software company needs to solve the problems of their customers. So it's, you know, again, like we've discussed earlier, there's upsides, um, but you need to understand your customer first. Yeah, and to emphasize on this, uh, so we also believe that some CBDC will be built with uh, DLT and particularly Ethereum or Quorum and uh, or Apple and Bezu, and others won't. But um, and and we also strongly believe that there is no one size fits all solution. It's just impossible. Each country, each jurisdiction have their specific. Uh, um, requirements, whether it's te in terms of uh, number uh, number of people uh, in the country or uh, the attachment to privacy, and, and so each approach is, is will be quite different. But we believe that at the core, the core layer, uh, which um, which is uh, brought with uh, DLT, which prevents all double spending, which is really the, the core of the technology to prevent double spending without a central party to maintain a central ledger is absolutely key. So this is one of the key benefits. The second one is programmability. So when we imagine programmability, it's already possible somehow with centralized systems where one, one centralized party will say, okay, if you do this action, I will um, do this output. What is again quite exciting is that with the LT, you can create those smart contracts, you can execute themselves to, um, uh, depending on an input that provide an output and all of this without any central party and with a significant trust because anyone can look at it, verify that it does what it say it does and, and that's really br bring a lot of value. And then the, the, what's even more exciting is the next step is when we start to have an ecosystem uh, such an open ecosystem, which is very different from our world garden system we have today. When we have this open ecosystem, we have composability, which means that products built by one company can leverage the product built by the others. And, and it goes really much further than the uh, open API or open banking API system where people can connect through APIs. Because here it's native in the protocol and that's what we have seen uh, recently or the, over the last year with the emergence of decentralized finance, where a lot of protocols build on top of stable coins and then there are aggregators. And, and we create the, this ecosystem that can just benefit from each other's innovation uh, and, and really allows us to, to create uh, new application and new services for the end users. So I actually want to ask, this is a structure question, um, and this kind of goes to what is perhaps at least to my mind, an inherent um, tension in the technology, as Matthew was saying, um, for a distributed ledger system to work well, it needs to be distributed. And obviously central bank digital currencies has the word central in it. And normally that does come from, you know, what we think of as a centralized institution. So for a central bank digital currency, what is the backend structure in terms of like, who's running nodes? Is it all like a permission chain? How do you spread that out to make it secure? And yet also I'm sure, um, you know, the more spread out, as we all know, the kind of greater limitations on scaling at least as far as I understand. So how are you guys thinking about how to structure given those constraints? So that's something we think about a lot. Um, you know, certainly, I don't necessarily think, a lot of times we think about whether or not there's a malicious actor intent, right? And that's, I think, a lot of what Bitcoin and ETH were based upon was the assumption of a malicious actor um, and the removal of a trusted party. Um, but it's certainly there's a lot of gains to be had from resiliency standpoint, uh, having a distributed system. And that's kind of where we look at the upside for distribution in our initial research. Um, but again, and again, we are exclusively focusing on the retail use case. Uh, if you're going to have throughput that's comparable to existing retail payment methods, you're going to have impact there. And so understanding how you can maximize resiliency, but also throughput and settlement finality for the retail use case is one of the most critical trade-offs. Uh, and so again, we think less about centralization and more about malicious actor intent uh, when we look about you know, centralized versus distributed systems. 
But can you, but can you also answer what I was asking about in terms of like who would be running nodes and, and how do you resolve that issue? Because uh, is it, is it just a permission chain or would there be any way to kind of open it up to other people? Or is that, you know, one of the potential attack vectors for uh, like some kind of, um, yeah, unfriendly actor on the network? So that's something we're still looking into. I don't think we've gone that far in our research. We, you know, we're still working on our core level code base. So that's something that we're currently mapping out, but I don't have a good answer for you on that yet. And Matthew, is this something that you guys have thought about? Uh, yeah, so from our perspective, <clears throat> so today central banks are really focused on permissioned blockchain where um, the, uh, the central bank and regulated financial institution like banks and payment service providers will, <clears throat> sorry, will uh, run nodes. And, and this uh, consensus will emerge through those regulated financial institutions. And the fact that the central bank is, as you say, central, but the fact is they are the only entity allowed to issue the CBDC. And that's fine. And, and that's or again, one of the benefits of the technology is that you can program into the protocol itself each roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders. Um, so yeah, really they focus on this and then this, those uh, regulated financial institutions for general purpose will be responsible to distribute it to the end users, but still in this open ecosystem where there is trust and uh, where the, the, the transfers are so simple between one uh, PSP and the other, and, and this, is, this will be seamless. But we also believe that, uh, and I'll finish with this, so, sorry, Rob, uh, is, is that we, also, we still believe that um, central banks will, um, in a couple of years, be actually quite open to public blockchains. We always do this comparison with uh, internet. People initially, when they see a new technology, they do not understand it, they see the problems, and, and indeed there are some limitations at the beginning, and, and, and they do not trust this technology. But as it is being implemented, as it is being used initially as a niche, and then by more and more companies, and we already see large bench, large financial institutions using public blockchain, we, st we do believe that some CBDCs will be either directly issued on, on, on public blockchains, or at least that there will be some bridges between the, the permission network built by the central banks and the public blockchain in which other companies are building their own applications. Hmm. I'd, I'd like to add. I'd like to add a little. Just, just I guess from a hyperledger perspective, and and in, you know, I'm, um, I've been around the industry over forty years, and and the the pace of technology and the way technology moves uh, is not in a straight line. Uh, and, and everyone kind of wants the answer immediately when an idea came out, but it's like finding a piece of metal and imagining an iPhone. I mean, it does, the gap between those two <laughs> is a whole lot of development exercises. So I think, you know, the, it's, it's a tribute to uh, the consensus, uh, Matteo and his company and, and, and Joe Lubin, who's a a colleague of mine on the on the board of Hyperledger, uh, that that the Ethereum uh, community started out as very public focused and and public chain, uh, but with Bezu and their contributions to the community, uh, they've made this tremendous investment in in private enterprise models as well. Uh, it's a tribute to to uh, Bob Bob Bench and Neha uh, and the work they're doing on. Uh, evaluating new security models because security and threat vectors are are ever present and ever increasing, uh, and the the role of Hyperledger with its greenhouse and its many projects is to bring together lots of different dimensions. It's not the game isn't over. It's like you know when the book on computers was written 50 years ago and saying, all right, that's going to be the model and it will have vacuum tubes and you flip these switches. Or the book first book on relational databases was written and and then that was that was the end of it it's a progression and we're all learning from each other uh the fact that we have these conversations uh and dtcc apparently is the only one on on this panel that is not writing its own blockchain uh software uh but we're investing through our our we have a couple of of prototype projects, uh, Project Ion, uh, that's doing clearing and settlement on DLT as a fully functional prototype. Uh, and we have this Project Whitney, which is a, a private market uh, securities issuance. And we've been able to write those on multiple blockchains, both public uh, and private, 
to understand them, to see just the way Bob was explaining, to see what their scale dimensions are, what it means to put out different nodes, uh, what it means from a resiliency perspective. And we're all sharing and we're all learning from each other. So it's a progression. And something else that I was curious about before we dive into what I think is probably going to be a somewhat meaty topic, which is the privacy issues that came up earlier. I was just wondering, you know, for normal public blockchains, transactions are typically paid for with a fee. Would that also be part of a central bank digital currency blockchain? So I guess I'll jump into that question because that's an important one. Um, there are very specific legal legal rule, legal laws, I should say, around how a central bank can charge for its services, right? So that is a constraint on a central bank build, at least with regards to the United States. There may be other central banks that may model it differently. Um, but I think questions about fee, and I guess the later question about privacy are really important uh, when you think about things like spam on network and DDoS attacks. That's something that isn't really talked about in CBDC conversations a lot is the simple question of spam. Um, but Stopping spam is really important and fees is one way to do it and having really robust identity structures is one way to do it. Um, those are two of the easier ways to fix that problem. And so understanding legal and policy constraints with regards to spam and DDoS attacks on one of these platforms is something we think a lot about. But as far as the US is concerned, there are constraints around fees for any uh, central bank payment process. Hmm. Okay, well, let's segue now to the privacy or Matthew, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I just wanted to add one thing is uh, you, you were comparing the, the transaction fee on public blockchain and CBDC. Uh, if it is built on, on private uh, blockchains, even if we still have what we call gas to, to pay for the transaction, um, it, it might not need to have a, a price on it. And so the reason why it has a cost on public blockchain is that you have to pay for the validators who participate to the consensus. Uh, and so it is slightly different and might not be required for, for, for CBDC. And I also wanted to emphasize on what Rob said uh, and uh, finish with this, that all DLT platforms, all blockchains are not created uh, equally. And so uh, picking the right platform that fits your specific use case will be very important. And, and even if at consensus we are really focused on Ethereum, um, we, we, we also strongly believe that there are great uh, alternatives uh, out there and, and that they will emerge and, and be widely adopted. It, it just depends on what use case you are, you are focused on. Okay. Yeah. So now let's talk about what Bob mentioned near the beginning, which I think is going to be of interest to a lot of people. He talked about how uh, CBDCs have the potential to have built-in KYC, which is know your customer, and AML, anti-money laundering processes built into them. And I think that obviously, you know, people um, have a lot of privacy concerns about CBDCs, particularly maybe because one of the first or the first to really be rolled out is the DCEP in China, um, which, you know, uh, there's, I think, a surveillance culture over there when it comes to their technology. So how is um, how are different central bank digital currency players thinking about concerns over privacy? What are some of the options for managing privacy when it comes to CBDCs? So I guess I'll hop in there. Um, I think with regards to our research, you know, I think the question of privacy in the United States remains one that needs a lot more discussion and is a critical policy question, but certainly a question that informs technology. What, you know, when we started our project, our main focus was how can we make uh, something useful for retail purposes, primarily meaning extremely secure with throughput and finality equivalent to leading retail payment systems. But one of our learnings has been that uh, you need to start thinking about privacy early in the stack. Uh, one thing that we've been educated by the MIT folks is that the later you add privacy to a system, the less private it becomes. Uh, and so that's something that we are thinking a lot about. And certainly we are not a policy team, we're exclusively a technology team. But understanding where a policy needs to enter into the platform is something is absolutely critical. And uh, our, I think more advanced discussions need to happen uh, to get a better understanding of sentiments around privacy with regards to payments, because I think it's still largely undefined, at least over here. Well, one thing that I was wondering about is, you know, Zcash and Monero have their viewing keys or, um, you know, ways to take a shielded transaction and have, you know, and uh, I guess prove, you know, certain aspects of that data to specific people. Is that uh, an option that's being considered? 
we're not like going directly into say, say Zcash and Monero. We have cryptographers that have worked on both platforms deeply that understand those methods very, very, very well. Uh, but that's not like, we're not modeling any of our systems to date off of Zcash or Monero or any platform that like that, you know, without question, the state will have to perform its financial intelligence functions. Uh, I think any institution, whether it's us, whether it's DTCC, any large banking entity, those rules are not going away, barring a change in legislation. So we need to understand all of our customers' needs. So that being the users of the dollar and the members in the treasury department that have jobs to do to stop financial crime. So that's a balance that has to be done. Um, the key thing for our platform is understanding where do we put that privacy? Uh, because I think regardless of how the privacy works, uh, we need to make sure that if data is collected, only the data should be seen by the people responsible for seeing the data and no one else. And I think that's the hardest thing is once you collect data, it's on you to secure it. And so that's the most important thing for us is making sure whatever we're required to collect is absolutely secure. And so maybe to, I think uh, I agree, privacy, there's a lot to be discussed uh, still. And I think technology is not the bottleneck. Uh, the, the, what's more important is uh, the decision of the central bank of how they want to design it. But when we look at the wholesale layer, so between the central bank and the financial institution, I think it is commonly agreed that <clears throat> the central bank, the, the banks do not want other banks in the network to see their transactions, the value, the, the quantity of activity. So this has to be made, made private to the other banks, but for the central bank, the central bank wants to have access to this information, um, whether natively or uh, uh, thanks to a court law or whatever, uh, they, they want to be able to have access to this information. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's one point. And then for <clears throat> uh, retail application, there, will, there are different approaches, uh, as you say, uh, uh, as, as, as far as I know, in China, it will be quite open. So even if the uh, identity of the users are not directly visible on the CBDC platform and the CBDC ledger, there, you will see all the transactions, you will see um, history of transaction. And so you could deduce some of the identities. So this is one option. And then there are honestly a lot of technical, technical options to, to, to abstract uh, or to create additional layers of privacy. Uh, just to mention it, there are uh, the, the most adopted ones. There are uh, um, uh, ideas around implementation, leveraging zero knowledge proof or privacy groups. So there, there are basically different uh, approaches, which um, yeah, will, will depend on the use case and the jurisdiction and the objectives. And so now let's talk about adoption because um, there, you know, just with the current system, uh, this will be quite a shift if something comes to pass with CBDCs. So, in general, how are a lot of CBDCs? Uh, sorry, a lot, how are a lot of central banks thinking about how to get CBDCs adopted? In terms of, you know, whether or not they'll use commercial banks the way that they're used now, or whether they'll have their own retail accounts, or uh, you know, just what are they thinking? Or is it just too early to even ask this question? I'm happy, so, happy to jump in, but uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll start. That that's a uh, starting with the banking intermediation. That's a critical question, right? right? There's really, really important policy implications to changing the current intermediary model. Uh, some some countries, such as China, have are going with a two tier model. Uh, there are certainly advocates for two, continuing the two-tier model here in the United States. Uh, that's something that uh, has, like we said, trade-offs. There's costs and benefits to that. Um, certainly, uh, a direct model to a central bank requires a material operational uptick by the central bank's activities. Uh, doing retail compliance, retail servicing is hard. It's a lot of work. It's very different than wholesale. Uh, and I think that's something central banks would be fairly new to most central banks. Um, I think there's a world, some central banks are looking at payment service providers uh, and techno the technology community has gotten very good at directly handling retail customers. That's something that we need to learn from as a central bank of how they do it and, and what makes them so good at it. Uh, but again, I think that's something that is what we call a phase two question. We don't think the core code base really changes much if you go through a two tier model or a direct model or a payment service provider model. Uh, but I think what's critical is 
institutions like the Federal Reserve understand the impacts of any change to the model, right? So what does that mean for small and community banks if their deposit base erodes to some extent because of CBDCs? That's something really important for, say, community banks and the communities they serve. So um, again, that's something we're looking at closely because we need to understand those trade-offs. But just out of curiosity, so I understand the discussions may not have gone too far in this, but um, if central banks were to deal more directly with retail customers, does that kind of enable them to do things that they can't currently do with uh, the model using commercial banks at the moment? Like, you know, are there sort of like pros to switching things up? I think there, there certainly could be, right? I, I think there's, so the FDIC does a really great research every year on the unbanked and the underbanked. That is something that is a really thorny question and has been really hard to fix. What we do know from the FDIC study is that certain people are unbanked because they choose not to enter into relationships with banks. Um, an open question is, would they enter a direct relationship with a central bank? Maybe, maybe not, we don't know that answer. But that is something that is seen at least by some researchers as a positive is, are there, the, are there certain unbanked persons who would rather work directly with the government? Um, that might be true. And so that's, those are the kind of things we look at. Certainly there are been advocates that since if they had direct accounts. So again, another issue where government benefits could be more quickly received, uh, but a lot of research has to happen and a lot of trade-off research has to happen because there's a lot of stakeholders. I mean, uh, you know, you look at, I mean, Rob, I'm sure with DTCC, the amount of stakeholders you have in your environment is enormous and getting all those people to the table to agree on a new model is extremely hard. And so you really have to understand all the issues to, when you bring all those people to the table, because it's, it's a dramatic change. Yeah, I mean, I think one of, one of the, the general first laws that, that we all adhere to is do no harm. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways of looking at the, um, the alternatives that technology can bring, uh, but there are, there are definitely some capabilities like uh, the comments we've all made about resiliency and, and security uh, that have been quite durable over, over many decades, and we don't want to lose a lot of those, those values. Uh, I am uh, part or an advisor to the Digital Dollar Project, and that does is advocating for a two-tier uh, system, a, a, a wholesale system uh, that involves um, interactions between the central banks and, and the, the banking tier, and a, a second tier that's, that's retail oriented. Um, I think there are a lot of different models, and, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the work that, that Bob is doing with MIT uh, and some of the other academic institutions that we're all, we're all speaking with and, and that are part of Hyperledger as well, uh, are going to contribute in a in a great way over the next few years to advancing thought leadership on this. Well, Rob, I actually wanted to ask you a question about what you said about how um, you know you're not trying to um, do too much damage with whatever changes you make or do no harm. But uh, you know, this technology obviously could um, bring a lot of benefits if it were to. Um, to do more than simply just uh, keep the existing processes in place. So um, in that regard, like how do you kind of work with the different stakeholders to talk about what different benefits you could get if you were to embrace more disruption? I completely agree with you. Let me, so let me just make, make that clear. And I think most of us uh, that are in, uh, uh, certainly in this, in this conversation, but in this ecosystem and that are trying to push the technology, um, uh, agree with that idea as well. I just, I think we've got this tool and we're a little bit afraid of the power of this tool. It's like a lightsaber in the hand of a three-year-old. Um, and and there, there, there's a bit of, you know, to some of the questions that are on the Q&A uh, and the earlier question before, do we need uh, DLT, distributed ledger, to answer central bank digital currency or even uh, uh, increasing or improving the efficiency of, of equity settlement or, or any asset settlement. Uh, the fact that the entire world is, is basically spending a tremendous amount of energy on reconciliation of information constantly, that everyone on this call has a different view of what a ledger is, of, of how much money or how many assets they have on the ledger. And then we have to go through a variety of different protocols to, to reconcile what we all should know as a central truth. 
uh, is something this technology can answer. Uh, does it need to answer it in a broad public, either proof of work, proof of stake model? Uh, is, is it able to trust certain entities like federal banks, like governments, um, uh, like certain institutions that were created specifically for trust? How do you trust them in the you know, event of, of security uh, uh, and malware onslaughts and, and various actors uh, looking to subvert that? Uh, these are all questions that need to be answered, but the basic premise that this technology can enable much more efficient interactions, much more efficient tracking of, of sources of truth, absolutely true. So I think there's a willingness of, on everyone's part to take a fresh look at those you know, long held beliefs that are traditional silos on mainframes were that needed to be reconciled with other mainframes was the way everything had to work. Um, we're ready to throw that out and say, let's move to something new, but we need to do it with, you know, with all the concerns about safety, soundness, and protecting everyone's retirement account, everyone's investments, everyone's pensions. Uh, you know, so there's that balance of how do you disrupt, but, you know, address the concerns of, of you know, people with real assets that want to make sure that they can, you know, pay the rent. And um, I actually want to call another question by Jacques Picontu, uh, which is, should CBDCs coexist with stablecoins or replace them? Um, I don't even know if this is something that uh, this, you know, that you are considering, but maybe I would be curious to just hear what your thoughts are on that. I think that's more towards Bob uh, and, and the Fed. I mean, I think the, the, the aspect of, of stable coins right now is a way of creating equivalence with, with the, uh, the crypto ecosystem uh, and what that evolves into once there's additional, once there's viable fiat currencies um, uh, issued by governments and viable other types of currencies issued by organizations like Facebook and, and consortium that, that support that, uh, how that balances out with the, the values underneath cryptocurrencies will be an interesting thing we're all interested in seeing. Bob. Uh, I, I can jump in. So I think there's two, th two different things uh, with CBDC and stable coins. One, and it's uh, about the aspect of money. It's um, either it's, uh, it is a store of value and a means of payments. And I believe that it's unlikely that uh, stable coins will become widely adopted as a store of value. Uh, for instance, even Libra, uh, the, the, the pro, uh, Facebook project, people will pay with this, but you will not keep your earnings and your salary uh, in, in, your, uh, in your WhatsApp wallet. It, it just doesn't make sense. And so what the, the, the way we derive this is that we believe that some stable coins or CBDC will be more appropriate to specific use cases. And, and so, for instance, we see on the public blockchain MakerDAO, which is a stable coin, which works very well, but and the, um, the way it is built and organized is fully decentralized. It's done by a community. And it will probably not make sense for DTCC to use it. DTCC will very likely prefer a, a CBDC issued by the Fed. But it would make sense for a number of projects that happen in the Web3.0. And, and, and similarly, we, we believe that some stable coin will be preferred for niche use cases uh, and, and will basically coexist uh, uh, with CBDC. Yeah, so uh, with regards to stable coins, now, we think about this a lot. I spent my prior career helping build one of the larger stable coins out there. Uh, USDC. Yeah. Um, that circle. Yep. Uh, and I think most stable coins right now, aside from DAI, are commercial bank deposits on a new rail. It's, it's commercial bank money. Uh, and I think that's fundamentally different than central bank money. Uh, and I think that, you know, for the countries that bring out CBDCs, I think that they'll they'll continue to coexist with stable coins. I think the stable coin use case will continue. Um, and I think that they will coexist. I think there is a use case for direct central bank money in a digital form for retail persons. Um, whether or not the United States chooses to do so, it's, it's a major policy decision above my pay grade. Um, but I think certainly uh, countries will 
certain countries are going to go forth with retail CBDCs and enable retail persons to have central bank money. Um, but I think stable coins will continue to exist uh, with through the commercial banking system, moving commercial bank money on new payment rails uh, and are, are going to achieve significant um, innovation through that way. Um, certainly, there's brilliant women and men working on the problems that can be solved with commercial bank money on these rails. And certainly our team looks to learn from them. Uh, but I think there are fundamental diff fundamentally different use cases for commercial bank money on these rails and central bank money on these rails. All right, so we're going to have to wrap up, but uh, before we go, why don't you all each say um, kind of what you expect going forward in terms of the next steps on this journey or, you know, what questions you're looking to resolve as um, these different efforts continue? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so we're, we're actually building uh, a fully functional prototype. Um, we call Project Ion, working with the fi our financial industry clients uh, to simulate uh, clearing and settlement uh, on a distributed ledger uh, in a accelerated settlement type model where you can optionally say, I want to settle this trade immediately. I want to settle this trade in a hourly net. Um, I want to settle this trade in two days. So some something that combines um, the, the, the current ecosystem and a digital uh, asset ecosystem. Uh, we're expecting to implement a cash token as part of implement of uh, part of that uh, prototype build. Uh, but we've been talking to the digital dollar project about making this an eligible pilot uh, for central bank digital currency in the wholesale markets. Uh, so we expect to be active working with um, uh, our, our industry, certainly working with, with uh, the Fed, our, our payment rail uh, on, on different models. And if we can help uh, advance the thought process on you know, how this could work in the wholesale markets, uh, we're, we're, we're all in. Great. Uh, on my side, I think uh, we are kind of at a turning point where in, in the last couple of years, central banks have been testing the technology to understand whether or not it's technically possible to create a CBDC. And, and I think when you look at all the reports, all uh, uh, conclude that it is possible. There are some uh, things where the technology has to be pushed further, but basically it's possible. But now what's really exciting is central bank will start to work with the private sector to uh, identify clear use cases, clear needs of how this CBDC can be really used and adopted. And, uh, and that will make things quite interesting. Great, Bob. I think over the next couple of years, you're gonna have a lot deeper understanding of the use cases here. Uh, I, I think the technology certainly makes this possible. Uh, it's transaction throughput really isn't an issue. Um, but understanding why people want this and, and convincing them and particularly the wholesale, the world that Rob and Matthew have been dealing with recently, um, I think that's really compelling because uh, you don't have the thorny issue of privacy and identity. And I think there could be compelling, compelling developments in that front if you get the right stakeholders in the room. Um, but I think, you know, policymakers are going to start catching up with technologists in this area. And I think that's going to be really, really helpful. Folks like the Digital Dollar Project, um, Consensus, Hyperledger, educating policymakers and getting them up to speed is really going to enable this technology to be better and understand how we can use it to help all the all the economies who want to approach this in a thoughtful way I think is going to be very interesting. Great. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all so much for participating and thank you to Hyperledger for hosting and um, yeah, we'll We'll have to resume this conversation at some point in the future. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Thanks, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.